So we are going to get started with um, panel number two, which will be focusing on humanitarian organizations and their responses to refugee crises. I mean, of course, I think as we'll see throughout the day, all of the panels will be overlapping because the perspectives of states and refugees and humanitarian organizations cannot really be separated um, in practice. But the focus um, of this panel is on, on humanitarian organizations. And I'm very pleased that we have a really nice array of perspectives to bring to the work of humanitarian organizations. Um, I will very briefly introduce our panelists so we can get uh, right to the discussion, but we'll note some of these differences as I do. Our first speaker, we'll just follow the order um, that's in the program, is Geraldine Chatelard, who is um, an anthropologist. Um, who has uh, worked um, a lot on Iraqi refugees, and I think that's what she will be speaking about today. Um, and she is a research associate um, at IFPO, the French Institute uh, in the Near East. Um, our second speaker is Margot Ellis, who is the Deputy Commissioner General for UNRWA, the UN Refugee Agency for Palestinian Refugees. So it gives us a perspective from within one of the premier um, humanitarian organizations in the region. Our third speaker is Henny Mawafi, who is a doctor and who will be speaking to uh, uh, at Yale. And he will be speaking to us about a health perspective on the question of humanitarian response. And then Adrian Fricke uh, is an attorney um, who will be speaking about uh, at U working at UC Davis on the Great. So we have an anthropological, a humanitarian practitioner, a legal, and a medical perspective on the question of humanitarian response. So without further ado, um, our panelists will speak for 10 to 15 minutes, then we'll have questions. Geraldine. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers of this conference for inviting me all the way from Jordan, where I live. Um, and um, I would also like to apologize if you hear the fan noise of my laptop, but uh, it's quite noisy. Sorry about that. Um, uh, as Ilana said, I've uh, been researching the issue of Iraqi uh, refugees, although I'm not a refugee uh, scholar, uh, for the past 10 years, more than 10 years, I started looking at Iraqis a long time ago, much before uh, their uh, displacement was framed as a crisis and was addressed by uh, uh, policy actions and humanitarian organizations. And I'm looking at things in a very long-term perspective. Basically, I'm looking at migration and displacement movements uh, from Iraq uh, since the 1991, but uh, uh, with even a bit more uh, uh, historical uh, background. Um, so, um, basically in 2006, 2007, uh, where I was already living in Jordan, I had been living in the Middle East for many, many years already at the time, uh, when uh, humanitarian intervention uh, started uh, shaping up, uh, um, it was quite interesting to see from the inside uh, what was prompting this response at a particular moment in time, whereas in, in fact, the movement of displacement outside of Iraq had been going on for already quite a while. So I'm not necessarily going to take a completely uh, uh, anthropological perspective on things, because I think it would drag us, you know, maybe too far away from the focus of this conference. But um, what I would like to say is that uh, certainly what uh, Julie Petit said uh, in the introduction, that each refugee crisis, as they are framed, is different, and each response is different. Uh, is particularly striking in the case uh, of, uh, you know, trying to have a comparative perspective be be between what has happened for the Iraqis as of 2007, and what has been or what is currently unfolding for the for the Syrians. Um, and I will try to characterize the type of humanitarian response uh, that was adopted to address the Iraqi uh, situation and in which context it was developed. Uh, again, you know, with a view to eliminating the differences uh, with the response to the Syrian refugee situation. In the case of the Iraqis, uh, the response was definitely highly shaped by states' uh, policies. Uh, again, uh, uh, Rochelle Davis has said that all refugee, all responses are political. The case of the Iraqi refugee crisis was highly political. 
uh, and it was highly political because uh, um, it was uh, tightly connected to the uh, American uh, intervention or invasion uh, uh, in Iraq uh, in 2003. It was also highly political because of the initial response of the main host states in the region, mostly uh, 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 Syria and Jordan. Uh, contrary to uh, 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 what has been happening in a number of host countries for Syrians, with the Iraqis, uh, there has never been, uh, uh, they, there were never camps uh, uh, which were set up. Uh, there were camps that were set up or reactivated for Palestinians coming out of Iraq, but not for non-Palestinian refugees. Um, and uh, uh, the main uh, actor of uh, the humanitarian response was definitely UNHCR, uh, which uh, some recent uh, analysis have um, uh, argued uh, deliberately moved away from its uh, strict uh, legal mandate of protection according to the 51 Convention to focus more on humanitarian assistance. Uh, which was a way to gain uh, um, access and 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 uh, uh, um, uh, improve uh, you know the relations of mistrust with the main host countries Syria uh, and Jordan again. Um, so um, another uh, uh, specificity of this uh, uh, humanitarian response was the setting in place of what is called in uh, um, within the refugee uh, framework international burden sharing. Uh, both through an extremely high level of funding, and this this might also answer the question of Nidal, right? Um, I mean, the, the funding was forthcoming very quickly when uh, um, there was a public acknowledgement uh, of the crisis, mostly from the part of the US. Uh, it was basically the best funded refugee crisis UNHCR had ever had to dealt with. Um, we are in a completely different situation with the Syrians. And uh, of course, funding uh, was forthcoming uh, because of a number of political uh, decisions which were uh, made. Um, so that, that's one thing. Large funding for uh, assistance, in-country assistance, uh, and I will talk about the implications later, and also the setting up uh, of a third country resettlement program for Iraqis, um, mostly uh, 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 with, with most of the resettlement places uh, given by the US. And the role of UNHCR in, in all this architecture was to coordinate international assistance and also the resettlement program between donors, international donors, mostly the US, but also multilateral donors like uh, the EU, um, main host states in the region, for states of first uh, asylum, and um, other international uh, actors, mostly uh, NGOs. Um, one of the uh, reasons I would guess, I mean, I, you know, it's just, I'm, I'm putting this as a hypothesis, it's not a definite question, but why uh, were there no camps that were set up in the case of the uh, Iraqi refugee crisis? Uh, in fact, as I've said before, Iraqis have been, you know, leaving Iraq in, in quite large numbers already in the 90s. Uh, I'm not even going to go back before that. So there was a known policy that was adopted mostly by Jordan in the 90s uh, to let the flow pass through. Uh, with uh, up to uh, 250,000 Iraqis in the 90s who claimed asylum in Europe. Uh, and uh, um, they continue basically p p post-2003 when um, new uh, uh, types of Iraqis started leaving Iraq immediately, uh, uh, even before the invasion and after the invasion, uh, Jordan and later Syria continued this non-policy, basically let you know the flow pass through, uh, do not uh, uh, bring any international attention on uh, the presence of these people for a variety of geopolitical reasons uh, and uh, also uh, uh, domestic reasons. Uh, as has been said before, um, many of these Iraqis had capital, uh, invested this capital, especially in Jordan, uh, either by buying properties or even by starting businesses. Uh, and uh, uh, there was no, you know, um, um, uh, uh, sense of uh, uh, a crisis which needed uh, the attention of the host governments. Plus, uh, there was also, you know, a, a level of blindness from the part of the U.S. and all the other uh, coalition uh, uh, members, which, of course, were not ready to admit that uh, their intervention in Iraq had created a humanitarian problem. So just to take you know, a look at figures, I've, I've, I've had in all what I've written on Iraqi refugees for a long time been very cautious and critical about the use of figures. Uh, 
but uh, I'm not going to dwell on this for too long. Um, but for Jordan, for example, uh, the, the people who um, were registered uh, at the peak of the number of registrations, uh, which is in 2009, 2010, the Iraqis were never more than 53,000 registered uh, with the UNHCR. Uh, in Syria, uh, the, the peak number was 161,000, if I'm not here, yeah, 161,000. And um, in Jordan, the people who were registered were mostly people who had entered before 2007. Uh, because in 2007, Jordan, because of the international attention that was brought into the Iraqi refugee situation, uh, closed its borders, or at least adopted entry measures which were uh, restricting entry to certain categories, uh, to categories of Iraqis, and it had as an effect, as an effect to redirect the flow in large part to Syria. Uh, now, what happened in 2007, it's true that in 2006, you know, it was the start of full-fledged ethnic conflict uh, in Iraq, and uh, there was an upsurge in the number of people fleeing the country, or also in internally displaced, but there was also a change of uh, policy uh, uh, in the states, with uh, uh, um, uh, a push from the Democrats uh, in Congress to admit that the American uh, invasion of Iraq had had uh, um, uh, um, serious humanitarian consequences. So uh, this shift of attitude prompted uh, um, the US to discuss with UNHCR and to decide that they were going to set up a donor conference uh, in Geneva to attract international funding and set up an, an, uh, an international humanitarian program for the refugees. But in the meantime, these Iraqis who had moved to neighboring countries had uh, settled, self-settled, mostly in urban areas, as has been said before already, because they were mostly from Baghdad and from urban backgrounds and uh, mostly from the middle class, if not even from, from the upper middle class. And so they went where it was more natural for them to live. They sometimes had social, family, or other types of connections. And even if they didn't have them, it, it seemed more natural for them to settle uh, in, the, in the big cities. Uh, so the, 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 the Iraqis were already an urban refugee population when uh, the international response to the crisis was set up. Uh, this, I think, is one of the reasons why uh, it was too late, basically, to uh, even discuss and think about the possibility of setting up refugee camps uh, in that case. Um, very basically also, because I have very little time, um, the, uh, um, uh, there was you know, an unsaid uh, agreement, untold agreement between UNHCR and host countries to use extremely high figures for the number of Iraqis. Uh, to inflate the figures, which were disproportionate compared to the number of uh, refugees registered with UNHCR, but also with other elements which could allow to assess the number of Iraqis uh, in these countries. But by inflating these numbers, it was a way of attracting a very uh, high level of international aid. And uh, the way this aid was uh, funnel through UNHCR and redistributed is also one of the interesting figures of the international humanitarian response, i.e. Uh, a good part of the aid was, was, was fun f channeled through the host states themselves to reinforce their uh, infrastructure and uh, their capacity to provide assistance to Iraqis, but also more widely to their own vulnerable populations. Uh, so both Syria and Jordan, in different levels, Jordan benefited more than Syria, but were definitely able to develop uh, their educational system, their health system, and various other sectors uh, uh, of, uh, um, of uh, the public uh, system, which often had absolutely nothing to do with hosting refugees. So if you look at this from a certain perspective, you can say that it was a bargain that was struck between UNHCR, but behind UNHCR, mostly the US as the main donor, uh, and the regional host countries to uh, provide humanitarian assistance through existing state uh, uh, or government uh, institutions to relatively large population of refugees, but not large to the level of what you are seeing today with the Syrians. Definitely not. Uh, and uh, um, in parallel, the system of third country resettlement was put in place to basically uh, take away from the Middle East and from these host countries the long-term costs. Uh, if you see 
refugees in terms of costs uh, of uh, 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 maintaining these refugees in the region. Uh, if you look at uh, um, registration figures of Iraqis in the Middle East, uh, and if you look at the number of those who have been resettled, in large part in the States, but also in various European countries and Australia and New Zealand, um, up to 46% of those registered by UNHCR have been registered or are in the pipeline. I've have been, sorry, have been resettled or are in the pipeline for resettlement. Which means that hopefully in a few years, uh, half of the registered refu Iraqi refugees will have been resettled. Uh, so this is, you know, basically this kind of grand bargain uh, which was uh, uh, established, uh, which, you know, if you look at it from a purely uh, um, uh, political science perspective, can be said to have been uh, uh, quite a successful uh, burden uh, sharing, uh, uh, international burden sharing system. It had many uh, uh, drawbacks, which I don't have time to talk about now, in particular in the way um, NGOs and even UNHCR we're trying to operate on the ground uh, to uh, uh, provide assistance because uh, it was very opaque and messy. Uh, but uh, um, uh, it was also quite a, quite a unique model through which UNHCR was able to uh, redefine its urban refugee policy, uh, through which they also uh, developed uh, the, the concept of protection space, uh, which already existed but had never been so formalized and conceptualized as during this uh, uh, Iraqi uh, refugee crisis. And uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, it doesn't appear to, uh, um, to be a blueprint for what's happening with the Syrians, but I keep wondering, uh, for example, how much, uh, in the case of, of uh, you know, Syria, for example, uh, and I'm more looking at internal displacement in this case, but all these NGOs which gain registration in Syria during, uh, you know, the, in the context of the Iraqi refugee crisis at very high costs. Uh, uh, Beth Ferris was saying, I think it was Beth or was it Rocha, that uh, they have joint bank accounts with the Syrian Red Crescent Society and very little autonomy. But this is a setup that was established to respond to the Syrian, uh, sorry, to the Iraqi refugee crisis in Syria. Now, how have these foreign NGOs transformed their operations within Syria to serve a different population and different needs is also is also um, important. So, yes, uh, responses are different, but how are they connected to each other, and how is their continuity? I think is also something which uh, would be interested and interesting to be addressed. Thank you. Just introdu introduce myself again. Uh, my name is Margot Ellis. I'm the Deputy Commissioner General of UNRWA. For those who are not familiar with UNRWA, UNRWA is the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East, very long name. And we have a mandate from the UN General Assembly to assist and protect Palestine refugees who are in our five fields of operation, the West Bank, Gaza, Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria. I thought of uh, that I take uh, focus today on the plight of Palestine refugees in Syria um, and to open up this, a broader discussion about Palestinian refugees, uh, but use that as a point of departure about the vulnerability of Palestine refugees in a protracted refugee situation. In terms of background, um, there are, were 540,000 Palestine refugees who were registered with us in uh, in Syria uh, in 2011. Um, we have, there are nine official camps, three unofficial camps. Uh, we, have, we are a direct service provider. In other words, we run our own education system, our own healthcare system, provide relief and social services. We're kind of like a government uh, providing state-like services to the beneficiary population. So as a result, as a direct service provider, we have 3,700 staff on the ground in Syria who are, who are teachers, doctors, social workers, et cetera. We had 118 schools, 23 health clinics, and 180 installations. So clearly, we are the largest UN agency on the ground inside Syria. 
So what's happened now, just describe the current situation and then describe how we got there. Of the 540,000 Palestinians who were registered there, out of a total population, about 22 million in Syria, half, 270,000, are currently internally displaced. In addition, there are 80,000 Palestinians who have left the country, 53,000 to Lebanon, 14,000 to Jordan, 1,000 to Gaza, about five to 6,000 in Egypt. And we estimate that within Syria itself, 44,000 are in need of assistance, so a very high level of dependency. Six of the 12 camps have become theaters of conflict, um, including uh, maybe you know Yarmouk camp, which is on just southwest of Damascus and has, you know, if you read the news, has been, uh, it's con considered a besieged community and one that has attracted a lot of media attention. Unfortunately, because we have such a large presence on the ground, we've lost 12 staff members have been killed as a source. Uh, and then we have another 25 staff members who have been either detained or currently are either detained or missing, mostly by the government. Um, in addition, over 50,000 refugee homes have been damaged or destroyed. And why this is important is because each of these homes really represents the accumulated wealth of several generations of Palestinians who have lived in Syria. Um, now, how did we get here? Uh, basically, in 2011, Palestinian, uh, as the start of the conflict, Palestinians were affected, but I'd say economically. Palestinians prior to the onset of conflict were, 27% were living below the poverty line, more likely to work in informal, in the informal sector. So they were affected that way. But they had enjoyed, um, up since 1956, have enjoyed uh, almost equal rights with, with Syrians. They were a very well integrated community. They could work on the local economy. They could uh, own property there. Um, then things started to change in 2012. What happened was conflict came to certain cities, like, um, and as the conflict ebbed in cities like Dera, Homs, Latakia, it surrounded the Palestinian camps, but it didn't actually go into the Palestinian camps until the real turning point was December of 2012, when there was uh, armed opposition groups uh, forcibly entered the Yarmouk camp uh, and pitted themselves up against government forces through the manifestation of, uh, there's a group known PFLPGC, which is a, a regime, a, a, it's a secular Palestinian armed resistance group that's aligned with the government. Now, Yarmouk is important because it's a community, one of the camps, one of the informal camps, that is really the, was the epicenter of Palestinian life in Syria. You had 160,000 Palestinians who were living there, very well integrated with their Syrian counterparts. As a result of this, the, this turning point, the, the basically the armed opposition groups coming into the camp, it, it's catalyzed a massive displacement from the camp. So of the 160,000 Palestinians who lived in the camp two years ago, you have perhaps 18,000 right now. And this, this phenomenon of the taking and holding of camps has been replicated elsewhere. Uh, as a result, it's created a, what I call, a, a vortex of displacement. So you have Palestinians who were whose families were displaced in 48, once again displaced within Syria, oftentimes multiple times, or displaced outside the, the country. Um, one of the things that, um, and then so in 2013, so it started in December 2012, and then in 2013 continued, and uh, because the camps became fair game for opposition groups, and there was this phenomenon of the taking and holding of, of camps. We also saw, the phenomenon of greater victimization of Palestine refugees. Palestine refugees, in large part, are, are Sunni Muslim. And um, so, but because they've been treated well by the regime, they, um, they're seen as potential, they're potentially uh, s suspected by opposition groups. Why were you treated so well? So the Palestinian what we've been communicating to our staff, but also to the broader Palestinian community in Syria is your best protection is to remain neutral because otherwise you'll be branded as a collaborator or, or as a, uh, 
uh, collaborated with the um, with the government or be su suspect by the government of siding with the opposition. And we fear that Palestinians who have left the country, who knows whether they'll be able to return. So it's been very difficult. And the um, I'm, I'm not going to go into all the details of your camp, but one of the problems is from the period of around July of 2013, for a six-month period, that camp was sealed. We could not get not only the, the disruption of health and education services, but we couldn't get food aid into the into the camp. And so you probably read about case, you know, allegations of starvation as a as a weapon of war, and this this is where it was all taking place. Since, uh, through a lot of media attention and a lot of pressure by UNRWA, we've gotten some access starting in January, but clearly it's not enough. So, for instance, in the last 30 days, 10 of the last 30 days, we were able to access the camp to provide food, uh, food distribution. But you're talking about an impoverished community who are trapped there, and when we do a food to, uh, distribution, it's a parcel of food for a family for 10 days. So uh, since January, we've been able to distribute about just over 10,000 parcels of food. But so clearly, uh, it's, it's, it's inadequate. So this is g going on. Um, another thing that I want to talk about is the, um, the how, do, how we adapted our program. So normally, we'd be running schools, running health clinics. So what, what a, in order to sustain the community, within Syria, we've had to adapt the delivery of uh, humanitarian services, or basically even developmental services. So because about one third of our schools are in conflict zones, we've, we've some of those, those, about a third of them are continuing to operate. But another third, we've been able to negotiate with the government to use in government schools in the afternoon, using UNRWA teachers to continue that the education for those children who can access schools. But in addition, we've had to develop our education emergency program, educational materials, home learning materials for, for students. But also, fortunately, we had um, developed in, in Gaza, we have a satellite television station that was uh, started operations about two years ago. So we tailored the educational programs that were developed that could be used by Syrian students. So there are basic lessons uh, for fourth through ninth graders right now in, in uh, English, Arabic, math, and science. We broadcast 16 hours a day. It's also on YouTube. And we don't know where kids are listening, because you can't really tell with satellite. But we've um, the data shows that there are 11 million viewers of of our, our program, of our educational program. So this is just one example of how we've had to ad adapt. Similarly, with healthcare services, only about half of our health clinics are currently operational. But what we've done is, because we have um, many of our schools have been taken over as refugee shelters, what we've done is set up health points within these temporary IDP collective shelters. And um, microfinance, some of the areas have, are under siege, so we've opened up microfinance services in safer areas. Uh, this is an, so I think we've, through adapting our program, uh, at, of our, our regular program, plus delivery of food and cash assistance, we've been able, in the last year, to deliver food and cash assistance and non-food items to the 400,000 individuals in need inside Syria. Uh, and I think the uh, the focus of the program, in terms of whether we're delivering our our normal program or our emergency program, is to preserve the resilience of the Palestinian population there, and to provide a protective framework for them. But the reason I wanted to mention the the situation of Palestinians in in particular in Syria is because it really poses some broader questions about Palestinians and protracted refugee situation. First of all, Palestinians, unlike other uh, Syrians uh, within, within Syria, um, have limited flight options. Um, if they can go to Lebanon, but the Lebanese have tightened the border recently, though officially they have an open border. But the situation for Palestinians living in, in uh, Lebanon is very, very marginalized. They can't work on the local economy. They can't work. They can't, and they're very impoverished, and they can't own property. Uh, Jordan, in uh, January of 2013, officially closed the borders to Palestinians. They cited that there are too many Palestinians. 
Palestinians already there. They don't want to upset the demographic balance. They were concerned with they had security concerns. So number one, the limited flight options. And then, of course, the question about the regional implications for stability. It really points what's going to happen to the whole map of the Middle East um, ten, five years from now. Uh, will the 500,000 Palestinians in Syria be able to some of them have uh, fled. Will they be able to remain there or not? And so the whole map of the Middle East could ship vis-a-vis -vis Palestine refugees. And it really highlights the importance of a, a negotiated solution to the Palestine refugee crisis, because um, that, that's the reason that they're refugees. And, and then uh, finally, it's the whole, what I call the existential question of, pa of Palestinians. I've often met uh, Palestinians within Syria or those who have, or have fled from Syria to Lebanon or elsewhere. And one of the things that they say is, when our families fled in 1948, we were welcomed in the region. We were welcomed in Syria. We were welcomed in, in Jordan. And what's, what's going to happen to us? And so the question is the, the, the future of the Palestinian uh, refugees within the broader Middle East. So I'll stop there. Thank you. opportunity, much better, uh, to uh, work uh, in the region uh, both uh, directly as, uh, providing clinical services as well as a consultant with several NGOs uh, in uh, the Middle East. Uh, I was a consultant with UNHCR when we were setting up uh, kind of health policies and procedures for the Iraqi refugees, so I guess I'm in a small part complicit in what uh, Geraldine referred to <laughs> uh, earlier. Um, so my comments are going to be uh, quite general, uh, and then I'm going to have an illustrative example at the end, uh, really trying to stay uh, on the point of humanitarian organizations and responses to refugee crises. I really wanted to focus on what are the kind of key elements of success for uh, humanitarian organizations in the Middle East, as well as barriers to that success, and specifically looking at uh, health NGOs. So obviously, uh, Everyone knows that uh, humanitarian crises kind of racked the Middle East uh, region. Uh, with 9 million refugees uh, in the MENA region, with millions more internally displaced. So this is just uh, looking at the official refugees, not including uh, Palestinian uh, refugees. Uh, and it also represents the highest proportion of internally displaced people uh, are within the uh, WHO MO region. We're Looking at what would be the traditional role of a humanitarian NGOs uh, would be the ability to enter into complex humanitarian emergencies independent of official government action. Now, I don't mean in independent of official government sanction, uh, but it's an opportunity for uh, the international community to mobilize support and services for uh, uh, people affected by conflict or uh, other types of humanitarian emergencies without directly intervening uh, as uh, governments per se. Uh, it also provides the ability to provide assistance in non-international non conflicts, which is like a very sanitized way of saying internal uh, conflict and uh, civil war. Uh, it channels private flows of funding uh, separate from uh, government uh, sources, and it harnesses the volunteerism of individuals uh, to meet the challenges posed by uh, CHEs or complex humanitarian emergencies. So. If you want to know everything about uh, Middle East NGOs, I found out there's a website for everything. So there's a Mengo's website, Middle East NGOs. And it's, a, it's essentially a, a hub for these organizations in Arabic and English. The website is not great, but it has a lot of um, uh, useful content. So I, I found it useful, I thought, to, to highlight them here. But the roles of NGOs uh, are pretty complicated in the Middle East. Uh, so there's the frequent um, 
accusation that NGOs and are setting up parallel structures uh, uh, to host governments. And this is especially relevant in urban centers, uh, where the argument that, well, we're providing services where services can't be provided uh, is a lot less uh, salient. So the Middle East is a highly urbanized area anyway. Uh, displaced people within the Middle East are tend to focus on uh, urban areas. So this accusation really does uh, ring true, at least in part, and I'll discuss that a little bit more later. Um, many international NGOs tend to operate through their local NGO partners, uh, but these NGO partners are frequently weaker than one would want uh, in, in many uh, Arab and Middle Eastern countries, uh, except the parastatal organizations. We've mentioned Afad uh, in Turkey, uh, Sark, uh, the Syrian Arab Red Crescent in Syria, uh, uh, had very strong uh, and were the primary funnel as the parastatal organization. They were the primary funnel through which international assistance was, was channeled. There was an attempt at the very beginning to do so with the Jordanian Red Crescent uh, uh, when the country kind of woke up to the large uh, Iraqi refugee flows in 2005, and then uh, that the capacity really wasn't there. So despite it remaining in place, uh, other NGOs uh, started to take a lead role. Uh, but it's also important to note that in the Middle East, not exclusively the Middle East, but certainly it's a, uh, a very important characteristic that large-scale uh, local humanitarian response is dominated by security forces and dominated by security concerns. Uh, in many countries, there's a lack of legal status for the beneficiaries and suspicion of international NGOs at times. So let me delve into each of these points uh, in slightly more detail. So what, as I said a moment ago, this charge of parallel structures is uh, it's frequent, uh, but it's only partially true. Uh, the fact that the displaced populations in the Middle East are largely urbanized uh, are for a variety of reasons. People obviously seek uh, economic opportunities. Uh, they seek safety in numbers. They also seek anonymity. Uh, the Iraqis that were displaced in Jordan and Syria, uh, no, part of the reason nobody ever had really good numbers on them is because they didn't walk around with T-shirts that say, I'm a displaced Iraqi, even though you could frequently identify them uh, both by their accents, both uh, uh, sometimes in the uh, types of industry that, uh, in which they were working, but people really made a very strong effort to fly under the radar. And uh, flying under the radar is tricky because when you don't have a legal status, it's a legal imper it's a like an imperative that you don't cross the security structure. Uh, however, you still need to find ways of accessing services, both for um, uh, accessing services as well as accessing economic opportunities. Uh, the parallel structures that I mentioned before, they tended to create conflicts uh, within NGOs providing the same category of services as the local government. Um, but the governments, I found, used these NGOs, especially the health NGOs, as a cutoff valve or as a flow valve. It's a way of controlling the uh, direct burden uh, felt by their local infrastructure, whether it was the local health centers, the local schools, etc. Now, the, the reason for that is not always just capacity or financial uh, ability to provide the services, but also sometimes to more gradually uh, introduce communities into uh, the governmental services uh, so that a local health clinic isn't suddenly overrun by Iraqi or Syrian uh, uh, patients that are that are arriving there, but to gradually institute their uh, accessing the government services over time. So this was actually a very important role that uh, health NGOs uh, uh, served in both uh, Syria and Jordan with the uh, Iraqi refugees, and then now uh, uh, certainly in uh, the countries that are hosting Syrian refugees. Uh, but unfortunately, well, not unfortunately. Uh, the reality is eventually economies of scale predominate. The ability of ministries of health to provide health services far outstrip local NGOs, international NGOs, even with UNHCR or uh, WHO or other uh, international agency support. So that is the trend towards which uh, uh, the kind of NGO government relationship uh, goes over time. I mentioned weak local partners. I didn't 
I didn't say that as a disparaging comment of, uh, uh, in reference to these local NGOs, but rather there's a weak civil society as a whole in many of these countries, uh, with notable exceptions of Palestine and Lebanon, where the weak central government has actually left open the opportunity for uh, very strong uh, civil societies. But even in countries with a history of strong civil, civic organizations and civic engagement, like Egypt, uh, are facing challenging times uh, in complex uh, humanitarian emergencies. Uh, NGO workers are harassed. I don't mean just international NGOs, I mean local NGOs. Uh, the, uh, we've seen NGO laws passed in Egypt and other countries that are uh, very intrusive into their business, are very highly restrictive of their activities. Uh, many of them are forced to operate not as NGOs, uh, but actually they, there's overlapping registration systems. So uh, many of them are uh, operating in the breach where they've registered as, uh, as a private company and they've registered as a health uh, clinic uh, when really maybe what they're doing is providing services to victims of sexual violence. But th if they do it as an NGO, then they're going to uh, attract unwanted scrutiny. So they do it kind of in the breach. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, uh, these uh, humanitarian uh, crises in these countries are frequently dominated, at least initially, by security forces. And then subsequently, it's the policies set by those security forces that uh, play out. And we talked about uh, the very strong central role in Jordan. Um, I'm just going to skip this slide uh, entirely. So we talk about this very strong central role uh, in Jordan, but such was the case also in Syria uh, with uh, Iraqi refugees, where there was an initial kind of passive engagement uh, because they were seen as passing through. And then as soon as there were very large flows of people coming in, the overwhelming uh, concern was the security concern. Uh, that's when you saw Jordan closing its border. That's when you saw the Syrian uh, government starting to restrict uh, access uh, or, or whether people could cross back and forth more, more frequently. And as we've seen throughout the so-called Arab Spring revolutions, uh, when crises are complicated by any type of civil or political unrest, the security forces become partisans and they can target the local population. And I mentioned in there Bahrain and Egypt, uh, uh, where there was not a formal war declared in Syria and Libya. And the biggest problem with having security forces involved, it's not that they are uh, evil per se. Uh, they are able to, uh, they have a good command structure, they're well funded, they can, op they can mobilize lots of people very quickly, but it's always, protecting uh, populations is always secondary uh, in their mission. Um, the evidence suggests that they neither prepare nor protect populations in advance. Uh, of any type of crisis, even when that crisis is impending or right on their border, uh, with the result that uh, governments in the region, because of their over-reliance on these security forces, are always in a reactionary mode, or frequently in a reactionary mode, with too few professionals uh, at the government level that are really dedicated to plan for the protection of civilians. Uh, we've talked about our brothers, our neighbors, our friends, our guests. All of these are awesome uh, terms. They're very endearing. Uh, they uh, lack any sort of grounding in international humanitarian law, as was mentioned earlier. Um, and I, I was joking earlier that if I knew that we were all in Turkey a few weeks ago, we could have just had a powwow there beforehand. But when I was there, I found people were almost offended uh, by the use, uh, the, the Turkish uh, officials that I met were offended by the use of refugee because somehow refugee meant that they were just providing some legal obligation that they didn't want to provide. Uh, but that, of course, flip, you know, uh, that uh, viewpoint uh, kind of neglects the flip side of that is that you are obligated to provide. Uh, uh, many large host governments in the region are not signatories to the Refugee Convention or they're doing backflips to avoid its application. Uh, and that complicates provision of services because when you can't, when people don't feel secure, they don't self-identify, and when they don't self-identify, it's harder to count them, harder to plan for them, harder to provide them direct services. Uh, and, and obviously, these countries fall along a spectrum, uh, depending on how centrally controlled they are. Um, I mentioned this suspicion of international NGOs. This is something that's more anecdotal. But there's a lot of conspiracy theories around the Middle East about international NGOs, uh, about uh, their degree of manipulation by uh, Western governments, whether they're infiltrated by uh, local or, or international intelligence agencies. Uh, but really, uh, a big that suspicion, uh, whether grounded in truth or not, ends up uh, making these NGOs targets. Uh, 
uh, uh, it's one of the factors that makes them targets. And uh, th since 2005, we've actually had national, we've had incidents against national staff exceeding uh, international staff. So it's, there, there's not a discrimination. It's not that you're of a, a fair-haired, blue-eyed uh, Westerner that you're suddenly going to be uh, a target. It's rather the white Land Cruiser that you're driving around that makes you that target. Uh, and in 2008, we saw the predominance of uh, Sudan and Somalia in those. Now, this example that I'll just touch on very quickly flies in the face of much of what I just said. Uh, and it's the Union of Syrian Medical Relief Organizations. So this is a union that was created recently uh, that uh, is the coalescing of several uh, Syrian as well as expat uh, uh, Syrian uh, uh, aid organizations or philanthropic organizations that all agreed to come under this, this one union. And they've incorporated in several countries throughout Europe, the US uh, and Australia, as well as a couple of countries in the Gulf. But what's very interesting about it is that what would have been otherwise very small one-off operations are suddenly now it have been brought to scale. Uh, and they are providing a single coherent voice uh, through which uh, local governments as well as international organizations can interface. Now, there's lots of uh, kind of uh, historical, uh, there's lots of, of coincidences that actually have made them very effective uh, in as much that they're all Syrians and have Syrian passports. Uh, of some form or another. Uh, they're able to cross the border. So they're able to provide medical services both inside Syria uh, where there's really kind of a vacuum of assistance. So that has caused a lot of the international community now to look towards uh, that organization and, and a, a couple of other organizations like it as a primary means of providing assistance inside Syria. Uh, in addition, uh, we talked earlier about the, the Turkish government initially having this incredibly robust response uh, as part of kind of Turkish PR and national uh, uh, interest, but then now maybe being overwhelmed by the number of, uh, of refugees that are coming in. They are now talking about developing safe zones inside Syria, as well as supporting organizations like OSM that can really provide. And they've ended up going from providing some refugee assistance on the border to really providing a full spectrum of medical and surgical services inside Syria during the war, you know, from, and with a variety of uh, facilities that go from a health post all the way up to a tele-ICU that I had the uh, privilege of seeing the other day. Um, so, the, but the keys to that type of success is they have access when access is scarce. Uh, they have connectivity. They focused very early on on connecting uh, the Syrian diaspora with Syrian doctors inside and providing means of telecommunications for people within Syria. So even though they can't pick up a landline and call right down the street, they're able to call uh, eight time zones away uh, for, to, for assistance. There's a very strong focus on human resources. What we frequently see uh, of NGOs in the region, especially those that partner with international NGOs, is that they cannibalize each other as well as the local health services. So you hire a doctor for $500, the next NGO comes and says, that guy's really good, I hear that he's very efficient, I'm gonna hire him for $800. Uh, that Nobody recognizes that that doctor is also the one that was supposed to staff the local health post, and now that health post is without, uh, is without a physician. They actually established a schedule of payment for all of their physicians uh, throughout their network. So they don't cannibalize. And they've created a sponsor, a doctor program, essentially, where people from around the world are able to sponsor an orthopedic surgeon, a primary care physician, an obstetrician, who, for other reasons, has decided to forego the tens of thousands of dollars they could make every month in the Gulf to stay in their home communities. But you know, for a few hundred dollars, a thousand dollars a month, they're able to uh, give them some means of subsistence. I'm actually going to stop here because I know that I've run over, but we'll talk more in, uh, in the question and answer session. Hi. First, I'd like to join my colleagues in thanking Mark Lynch and his incredibly capable team for putting this conference together. It's always such a pleasure to come and speak with other people who are working on the same subject. And I feel like I learned so much, and it's a great chance to share with everyone. Um, 
I'm a consultant. I am an attorney by training. I also have a degree in Middle Eastern Studies from New York University. And um, people often say, what is it that you do? And the answer is everything. My clients are NGOs that have programming in the Middle East and North Africa. And since 2012, I've primarily focused on Syria. Today, I'm going to speak about one project on which I'm a consultant and for which I recently traveled to Lebanon for 11 days. So that is through the University of California Davis Human Rights Initiative, as well as the Institute of International Education. You might have heard of IIE if you have received a Fulbright because they administer the Fulbright grant throughout much of the world. They are uh, an, NG an higher education NGO that has been in existence since 1919 and importantly for both this crisis and many other crises, they have a scholar rescue fund. Um, so, and that is one important aspect of this work that I will not address today, but I want to highlight to anyone who is a university administrator that they are always happy to discuss placement of um, Syrian professors. So three big ideas about what I'm going to discuss today, which is access to higher education for Syrian displaced youth. And I really should say refugee youth because that is the subject of this conference. However, as all of my colleagues have noted, there's a huge number of Syrians who are not registered. And many of them are working um, the academic system to try and, specifically in Lebanon, um, to have legal residence. And I'll talk about this more later, but I just wanted to flag that as an important distinction that although technically what we're really interested in is the articulation of humanitarian organizations with NGOs and other organizations that are providing services to students, including universities, we're also considering a broad, in a broader sense people who have not yet chosen to register. So the numbers are much bigger, basically, than the ones that have already been represented. So as we've already discussed, there has been a tsunami of human beings coming out of Syria. And I think that um, Beth Ferris said earlier that an IDP moves three times before becoming a refugee. I've heard five times. Regardless, people, people will move many times before they become refugees, which means that the huge number of IDPs currently in Syria some significant portion of them will leave Syria. We don't know the timeline, but it means that it's a really huge problem. Our, our project's particular intersection with this issue is the fact that so many of these students, or, so, or rather so many of these people, are in fact Syrian university students. The Syrian education system, for anyone who spent time in Damascus, was heavily subsidized by the state. In 2007, uh, IIE has statistics that indicate that it cost approximately $30 to attend a public university in Syria. Barriers to access, therefore, were extremely low. Now, this is leaving aside the quality of the education. It's leaving aside the entrance exams. It's an exam-based system. Um, we could talk about that. That's a whole conference in and of itself. However, the point is that there were very few barriers to access to higher education, and in fact, by 2010, there were roughly a proportional gender representation in Syrian universities. That is significant in the sense that these are populations of people who are mixing in a, in a public, in a quasi-public or a public space, and they were mixing in a co-educational space. And why is that important? Because getting back to what Julie opened with, what is Syria going to look like in five years, 10 years, 15 years? These are serious opportunities for engagement of young people who see themselves as university students and who are used to interacting with each other in a public space in an important way that could mediate some of the serious social ills that have been incurred by this conflict. So that's big thought number one. Big thought number two is something that we've all gestured at, 
but I think that Ben Parker, who's the former head of uh, UN OCHA in Syria, said, essentially, the amateurs have stepped in where the professionals have not been able to provide services. And that's very true in Syria. It's also, interestingly, um, very true in Lebanon for all the reasons that many of my colleagues have eloquently explained, the lack of a weak state and the development of a civil society. And today I'm going to talk about one of the many organizations that we assessed in our recent field mission who has a model that appears to be working in a minimal way. So uh, addressing the question of what's actually working, we'll talk about that um, in, so, in, in a limited way. And it's important to understand that what amateurs can do, and by amateur I mean non-traditional INGOs. So for example, local organizations or even regional organizations that may not have very strict funding transparency requirements. Some of them may be, in fact, religious organizations. So I'm using, uh, I shouldn't really use the word amateur because it sounds derogatory. What I mean is a non-traditional uh, service provider that's operating in a local or regional context. And the third big thought is that variation is the rule in Syria. So as complex as the Syrian conflict is, the landscape, the social, political, and economic landscape for refugees in each of the host countries, whether it's Morocco or Bulgaria or Lebanon, is going to reflect that complexity. We see this mapped very, very clearly in Lebanon in the sense that parts of that country are really only comfortable for people from certain ethnicities. And here I borrow from Lemise's definition, which is very useful, which is a way of describing a line of cleavage. In the Syrian case, it often has to do with their perceived religious or ethnic affiliation. During our recent trip, we went to Tripoli for two days, a terrifying and interesting experience. Um, for those of you who have not spent time in Lebanon, uh, Tripoli is very closely linked to Syria, economically and politically. And while we were there, Qalat al-Hassan fell, and there were direct, um, there was shelling outside of the city while we were there. Um, and several grenades were thrown near where we were interviewing. So there are very real security concerns that speak to the ability of humanitarian actors to provide services in country because, um, because their job is to protect their, their workers as well as provide services. And this is, of course, one of the reasons that non-traditional service providers are prevailing where traditional INGOs have been unable to act. While we were in Tripoli, we met with an organization called the Lebanese Association for Scientific Research, LAZER because it's primarily francophone. And although it, has, it was established um, prior to certainly the Syrian conflict, it developed, it has a very entrepreneurial head and kind of visionary one-man show, as many NGOs are. And he was able to secure significant private funding for 200 university students. And he was able, through his very capable staff of three people, to process 700 applications in one month's time for Syrians resident in Lebanon to attend higher education. And in the end, he was able to parlay this into some peer NGO participation. So he was able to get some donations from partner NGOs in Lebanon who jumped onto his initiative, which is an interesting model. And essentially what they did was document very clearly their method. They posted online, but they also used print material, which speaks to interesting questions of how you reach urban communities. These are primary, in Lebanon, they're all by definition urban communities, although I think no one is kidding themselves that there are no camps in Lebanon. Um, I mean, the Bakaf Valley is full of informal housing. Um, however, they very clearly focused on people who had accomplished at least half of their university education. So within that 700, uh, the group of 700, they prioritized 
business, education, literature, health sciences, and media as modes of study that would potentially be useful for Syrian refugees. And they very clearly said, we are investing in Syrian refugees because whether they stay here or go somewhere else, they will need these skills. Now, they also um, noted that the vast majority of the applicants were men, which is a very important thing to note. There's, there are at least two reasons for this. One is that many Syrian students, well, of course, military service is compulsory in Syria. And in fact, youth flight from Syria is in part because of detention at checkpoints and um, at least perceptions that university registration or ta'jil is not being uh, recognized and so people are being taken. Um, because my understanding of the refugee law, or rather not refugee law, the, the law of residency for Syrians currently is that they get one six month free visa that then needs to be renewed for $200 and that if you fall out of this scheme, you have to pay $600 to acquire a new visa. So there are very heavy fines associated in staying in Lebanon. However, if you register as a student, you have legal status. And again, all of this is outside of registering with UNHCR. So that's an important consideration and sort of would be very important when thinking about scaling up any initiative to kind of get at the opportunistic use of student visas. Um, however, it's also important to think about um, the fact that they were able, despite the, the sort of huge representation of men in their pool to get 47% of the applicants to be women and 53% to be men. And I think that in any educational proposal that goes forward, there will have to be a real focus on the gender aspect of any program because um, families will probably, families report that they would like to keep their sons safe by sending them to the university, but it also has long-term follow-up effects for women. Um, I think that this is an appropriate point to pause and say from a legal perspective, the mandate for higher education, interestingly, lies with UNESCO, which <laughs> Geraldine knows intimately. And um, that in and of itself is an interesting uh, situation, how certain organizations come to be in charge of departments or services. Uh, UNHCR, however, is also very interested in higher education. And when we went to Beirut recently, UNESCO joined us for some of our focus groups. UNHCR was unable to because um, there was bombing in the area in which we were um, interviewing. However, they do have someone based in Geneva who works on higher education. And there is interest from these large organizations. The real question is how to articulate. And I think that speaks to some of the concerns that Hani has talked about with um, states and parastatal organizations and concerns um, with usurping the state-like actions of the state. So what does this mean for Syria? Well, I think that if there, we firmly believe that if there is, if higher education drops out of the landscape, and I believe Lemis put it as one of her indicators of a strong refugee policy, access to services, including medicine and education, then we're looking at a vast and permanent underclass of undereducated people who have a tradition of higher education and who are interested in going back to Syria. And I think one important thing to think about is that um, when we talk about displacement and refugees, um, it's really important to uh, zoom in and talk to people about what they plan to do and what they hope to do. And I think um, when considering language policies, there's a phenomenon which some of you may know of um, of the Free Syrian University in Turkey, which is a university that is not accredited by any Ministry of Education. However, it is a form of higher education, it represents itself to be a form of higher education, and classes are conducted in Arabic. And importantly, the second shift schools that are 
funded by the Coalition for Young Children in Lebanon are also conducted in Arabic. And so I would just posit that education can be an extremely important piece of what Syria looks like going forward because Syrians are interested in education. Okay, thank you very much to all of the panelists. I think that all of these presentations will give us a lot to talk about. So I'm gonna open the floor for questions. Um, I believe there's a microphone that will go around, um, which you should speak into, partly because it's being recorded. So just uh, if you have a question, uh, quickly introduce yourself and keep your question to a question. Nadal uh, Vitari again. Um, actually, talking about the Yarmouk camp, um, I want to say that it, it's happened with me personally. When I went, fled from Syria to Lebanon, I went to Anorwa in, in Lebanon and said that, look, I'm Palestinian and fled from Syria because I have security problems, blah, 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 etc. And the, the, the answer was that we can't help you. Okay, I understood that we don't have the protection status under the, uh, the responsibility of, of UNRWA, like other refugees in, uh, in, in this world. And I don't know why until now the they United Nations didn't add uh, th this mandate to UNRWA to protect Palestinian, uh, to uh, the protection, I mean, of uh, to, to Palestinian refugees. So that I was for a year and a half in Lebanon illegally. I couldn't re uh, extend my my, uh, my visa. I couldn't uh, have a protection status from UNHCR and UNRWA doesn't have this mandate. So so it's it's very complex situation. And on the other hand, I want to, to, to emphasize and to, to make something clear that the problem and the crisis in Al Yarmouk camp especially happened just when the Syrian regime pumped the camp from air, when the Syrian Air Force pumped the camp from air, so that after that, uh, uh, they actually the same day people f started to flee from the camp to other places and then the other conflict between uh, G general command and the, the opposition groups happened. And to make everything clear, wh who is sieging the camp is the regime and who is preventing to enter the assistance and who is preventing people to come in and to go out of the camp is the regime. Uh, actually, I couldn't sleep yesterday because I was reviewing the third, our third uh, <coughs> report about, I mean, the Palestinian Association for Human Rights in Syria. Our third annual uh, report about the force disappeared, Palestinian force disappeared in, in Syria. About 145 people were forced disappeared and then they are now killed under torture. And one of them was Khaled Bakrawi, who is one of your staff in Syria, who is even on Orwa the Dent mourn him. And this what made us as Palestinians angry. <coughs> Actually, there is a lot to be to, to comment about about the the the, the role of uh, the the NGOs and the international community and 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 even the assistance and the Syrian Arab Arab Crescent. As I was managing the 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 the, 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 the program of supporting Iraqi refugees in Syria with in Syrian Arab Red Crescent and Danish Red Cross and the and the workers of uh, of this uh, of of assistance in Syria. There's a lot of comments which is really need a, a, a panel or or a, a, a an article or a, a study to to say. But I what I want to to say now that because that Syrian that that is still Syrian revolu revolution from my perspective, regardless all uh, the 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 perspective uh, of of you you say uh, that is a civil war. It's another story. But this Syrian revolution is was is orphan and the Syrian refugees are really orphan and the international community response toward the Syrian crisis is really I, I can't find the word but it's really it's really sad and it's really it, it's really bad and uh, there's a lot to say but this is what I wanted to just to to to, to make sure that everything is clear and people who 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 were obliged and forced to eat dogs and cats inside the camp is just because the regime is closing the gates and because this regime is preventing them 
to stay alive, to, to keep it and, and, to, and to go out of the camp. And uh, now, actually, another, another thing, what we are now promoting to... I'm sorry to as, interrupt, but yeah, I think yeah, I, I'd uh, like to give the panel uh, a chance last, to respond. Last, last thing. Now we are, pre in, uh, as Palestinian civil organizations, we are promoting now and, and we have demands just to, uh, to add a, a resettlement uh, resettlement uh, section uh, uh, or um, uh, a mandate for a norwa for Palestinians because every 10 years we have a problem and the disaster regarding Palestinians in Kuwait, in Iraq, and in Lebanon, in Jordan, and now in Syria. Thank you. Thanks for your comment. Um, in terms of the advocacy with regard to Lebanon, both UNRWA and has been working with HCR on this whole question of the visa, uh, especially the visa after one year, the $200 per person. And so it is, we are working behind the scene because otherwise uh, both Syrians and Palestinians alike are not being granted these visas uh, or if they can't afford to. And then so their, their status is irregular and then therefore they're vulnerable. So it's not like we're not aware of it, but we are advocating uh, along with HCR on this issue and to keep the border open. I understand what you're saying about uh, your book. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to assign blame. I know I was outside, um, I went to your MOOC camp back in, um, in July of 2013. This is just before the closure. And uh, we had a food distribution point in, uh, in Zahara. So people at that point could come out, get the food, and go back in the camp. But then the government sealed the, the border. So they are controlling the Batika or whatever, the, the various crossing points. But what we're trying, I don't want to assign blame. Uh, there is times even when the government allows us access to provide um, food aid into the camp, we can't because all of a sudden we're in the middle of a distribution. and. Uh, people are shooting at each other. And so I'm not, I'm not minimizing the fault of the regime. I'm just saying that what we're saying is unimpeded humanitarian access regardless of, uh, and basically, and, and the message is targeted to all actors in the conflict. Hello. I just want to say I really appreciate your comments. And I um, learned a lot of Arabic in Mukhaim Yarmouk. So I appreciate that it's an important um, social and cultural site within Syria and that what is happening there is terrible. Uh, Abby Taylor from Georgetown University. Thank you very much to all of you. I wanted to ask a question to Dr. Chatelard about Iraqis who are more recently displaced. Um, we've obviously seen in, in December, January, even now, the displacement in Anbar, and it seems a lot of it's internal, but I wonder if Iraqis are still able and are coming to Jordan, and what is the protection space, if we use that word, that they are now seeing or not seeing? How has it diminished as they are now another forgotten population in Jordan, for example? Not working. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Yes, indeed, uh, um, Iraqis are coming. They're even coming to uh, Syria, surprisingly, you know? uh, uh, even following the recent uh, um, um, uh, tensions and, and, and uh, government intervention and fights uh, in the region of Anbar. Uh, people manage to come to Jordan, although there are restrictions on entry. You can always find your way uh, around these restrictions through uh, you know, taking an, a medical appointment, for example, which uh, in Jordan, which allows you to uh, travel to Jordan. I mean, there are various ways. There are also uh, uh, lots of family members who are in Jordan. So people come, and uh, you see the, the signs when you talk to uh, NGOs, because uh, people do try to access uh, uh, NGO services. NGOs report, international NGO reports that in the past six months there has been you know, a, a, a renewed uh, trend of Iraqis uh, coming to uh, register. They also go to the UNHCR and, 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 and you know, register, uh, but it's not huge numbers. Uh, they are forgotten in the sense that, of course, the Syrian uh, uh, crisis is getting all the attention. 
uh, but they are still funds uh, for the for the for the for the uh, Iraqis, and a lot of the NGOs which had been present in the past are trying to combine programs to address both the needs of the Iraqis and the Syrians. So it's not that there is nothing which is being done for them anymore. theirs. Um, in, well, m multiples of you may want to address, but in some ways this is a question for Hanny based on something that Geraldine said. And I, one I was very interested in across these um, presentations on the ways in which um, the sort of layering of, of humanitarian experience from, you know, sort of repeated crises um, is working and not necessarily in the way that we often talk about it because we often focus on large international NGOs that move around, right? So have their kits, their set forms of practices that they deploy from, from one situation to another and as Rochelle noted earlier, don't necessarily bring a local knowledge but, but bring a sort of set, a, an understanding of what humanitarian practice is. But what many of you were talking about was local or at least locally connected um, organizations that may be bringing experience fr from one situation to another. And Geraldine, you sort of put the question of how do we think about what, for example, what the, the work and the experience and the confrontations perhaps that, that, that organizations had in responding to the Iraqi crisis, how that is then getting redeployed or reconfigured um, in the case of uh, Syrian displaced people. And so I was wondering one uh, actual question for Henry, whether the, the, the network that you were talking about um, has those kinds of roots. But, in, but then, you know, maybe a more broad question for all of you, what, to what extent do you see this kind of layering happening? Um, and how, you know, to, to what extent are people reflecting on it or have the capacity to reflect on, on that sort of layers of experience? And maybe even going back before the Iraqis to the Palestinian instance. What I can say is that um, I think that there is a uh, layering of experience uh, at the local level, uh, especially by the governments, uh, actually. I mean, looking at, uh, I mean, Syria was previously the host nation and now is actually the source of conflict. But looking at Jordan, I think I think Beth mentioned in the first panel that the Zaatari camp was like set up intentionally. And this is purely just my personal opinion, but I think it very much was set up intentionally because the Jordanians were always in this position of saying, oh, we have this, this great need and having really no good way of uh, documenting and evaluating the, the magnitude of that need. Uh, and when uh, FAFO and other organizations came from outside and they made estimates, the estimates were wildly uh, disparate from what the common kind of discussion was. So, you know, then those reports were kind of uh, kept quiet for a little while. And I think that one of the, the kind of learning points uh, that happened was it's just much easier for the government to keep a handle on things if they, if they keep things close to the border, if they keep, you know, keep things in, in camps, and then even when not in camps, uh, just kind of not allowing it to penetrate fully into the country. Now, obviously, they can't do that uh, entirely, but I think that you're seeing uh, the Turkish government, in many ways, is now starting to do that where they're concentrating more and more of the resources on the border, not just because that's where the majority of the people are. They're also making it more difficult for people to penetrate deep into uh, deep into the country. As far as that organization that I'm working with, interestingly, many of the uh, individual physicians that had started these individual organizations prior to their uh, becoming this union had experience uh, in providing humanitarian assistance in previous crises. Um, not just in the Middle East, uh, in Haiti, in Latin America, uh, et cetera. And it was kind of through that exposure uh, to different crises in different settings, as well as to how the international uh, humanitarian community works, that they were able to come to the consensus of, we can't be a bunch of like individual little pods, but we have to kind of coalesce together um, uh, to interface more effectively with the international community. I would agree with Hani. I think that governments, whenever they are governments, which is not the case in, in Lebanon, as mm -hmm. you all pointed out, 
they do learn. I mean, in, in, in Jordan, you know, you can see layers and layers. And in, in my view, it goes back even before, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the 2000s. I mean, uh, the, the, the Jordanian government learned in the 90s that they could let the Iraqis pass through. And that's what they started doing post-2003. And it took, you know, American policy and also a real surge in, in the number of, of uh, people coming into Jordan to uh, shift and uh, to a new paradigm. But now they certainly have learned, and what I know from discussions with uh, both uh, uh, Jordanian officials and, and, and uh, um, UNHCR officials in Jordan is that UNHCR was opposed to the, uh, to the uh, creation of camps in Jordan, and the government pushed for the reasons you mentioned, visibility, also because they felt they, they were starting to lose credibility by having pushed up so much, inflated so much the numbers of Iraqis that uh, they were fearing that, uh, uh, you know, it was going to be difficult to uh, uh, um, um, argue for a, a large presence of, of Syrians. So it gave them visibility, but also because uh, there were other donors to the play in this case, which were donors from Gulf countries. And the donors from Gulf countries insisted on uh, visibility and on hosting refugees in camps. As you know, in Jordan, there is more than one camp. All the, the other ones at the moment are not completely functional. So yes, governments are learning. I'm not sure um, NGOs are learning for the, you know, the classical reasons that we all know about, which is you know, turnover uh, uh, in personnel, uh, uh, little institutional memory, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. People move from one place to, to the other, and they take the memory with them. But um, you know, it would be interesting to look at what is the role of the local staff in this, these NGOs. But all the local staff also uh, uh, turns uh, quite a lot. But uh, what what is the role of the local staff in in, in maintaining this institutional memory and and um, and learning from uh, previous uh, situations and how much they can influence you know new decisions and new policies? That's a question mark. I also just want to add that what. The lessons that uh, Geraldine and I just referred to that the governments are learning are fine as lessons for them, but they have really, very real human rights implications. I mean, the fact that you know keeping people close to the border makes it easy for the government, but that does not necessarily mean that it's a good thing from a human rights perspective to keep people close to the border, far from uh, services, economic opportunities, and close to the conflict. Um, so I didn't want to endorse that. I just wanted to say that that's kind of seemingly what's happening. Hey, thanks for a, a great panel. This question is, is a fairly practical one, and, and primarily for Adrian, but anyone else who wants to pitch in. Uh, Miriam Lowy, Wendy Perlman, and I, and a lot of other people, we've been talking for a while about how universities can actually help in, in, a, in a concrete way, and you know, trying to figure out, and so you're talking about you know, the Scholars at Risk uh, program and uh, the, what's happening with your program in Lebanon through IIE, but at the secondary and university level, you know, what are kind of the lessons learned of the kinds of programs and NGO interventions that work and don't work. I'm thinking about the continuity question and you know the specific needs of education for, for these communities. I mean, what, what have you thought about that that we might take away as we try and deal with these things? Before I let you answer, Adrian, I'm just going to take another question. Sorry. Thank you for a great panel. Uh, my question is more about um, the non-international NGOs and maybe even not even local NGOs but the ones that fall outside of the um, of the groups in Jordan or elsewhere that that meet around humanitarian assistance, so they are the religious NGOs primarily. A lot of Muslim charities that don't operate within the international refugee sort of aid regime, but but do operate within the charitable organizations that are monitored by the government or not, or, or managed, sorry, I shouldn't have used the word monitored, managed by the government or not. So those exist a lot in Jordan um, and provide amazing services, but they're totally sort of not talked about in this world that we live in. Um, one of you mentioned the Gulf and what that the visibility, and that's important. And then on the other side, in Lebanon, you see these same organizations, you see organizations also working for all sorts of um, purposes, but you also see Christian missionaries coming in, um, talking to refugees about Jesus and how great he is, and sort of what that does to the provision of aid 
without any sort of regulation of those kinds of things. So if, you, if any of you, you have insight, I just think it's a totally understudied um, subject. And if anyone has thoughts. Let me first let Adrian respond, and then, then every, everyone on the panel can respond to these questions, also any concluding thoughts. Okay. Thanks. Well, first, I'll respond briefly to what Rochelle just said, which is um, a point that had I had more time, I would have made more clearly in my presentation, which is that what is working for the short-term goals, for example, in our case of access to improving access to higher education, is not necessarily um, does not necessarily make for good policy on an international humanitarian level. And that gets back to discussions of uh, transparency and funding, pr mandates, um, which uh, the, the issues of trust that were discussed on the earlier panel. I mean, this is a whole conference in and of itself. And I think, um, I mean, sort of, I actually have a colleague at Harvard Humanitarian Initiative who is studying this right now, why medical NGOs are not articulating meaningfully with international donors. Um, for the kind of work that Hanny's colleagues do. So I think it, it is a really big question. I, I don't have any answers, sadly, but I do have some opinions. Um, so to get to your question, Mark, I think, you know, I think of nothing else these days, actually, as I'm writing a report <laughs> based on our field work. And I should mention that our study started with a preliminary assess assessment in Jordan last year with Tara Siegel, who's sitting right there, who assisted us. Um, she was resident in Jordan at the time, and my colleague Keith Wattenpah, who is not able to be here today, but sends his regards. Um, and that was really an incredibly rapid assessment to take the temperature of the situation and to see essentially what was going on um, with Syrian uh, refugees who identified as university students or people who would like to be university students who are qualified to go to university. And what we found was interestingly that within the humanitarian community, um, there was a kind of blanket position that there were no students in Zatari camp, which was fascinating because we went and interviewed a whole lot of them. And had we stayed, we could have interviewed a whole lot more. So I think that um, part of the problem is optics. Part of the problem is that we're dealing with an enormous, er essentially, the humanitarian community is dealing with uh, um, an incredibly challenging situation that will probably be reshaping humanitarian practice by its enormity, I would guess. Um, and is also important because I, we believe very firmly that higher education represents a very important opportunity for some, some positive action to come out of this crisis. And um, while it's not something we would wish for, um, one does not have to be cured to be healed. Um, in an optimistic framework. So getting specifically to your question of what universities can do, the scholar, um, uh, scholar Rescue Fund is distinct from SAR, although they have worked together in the past. And um, I can definitely provide you the information of my colleague, James King, who um, helps run that program. Um, I think, you know, I can say that Scholar Rescue Fund has received um, it, almost, I think it's more than 50% of its worldwide applicants are from Syria. So it's, uh, the, the need is very pressing. It continues to be pressing. Um, so to the extent that there's any space at universities, there are funding implications. Um, but uh, it's, it's a very real problem. I mean, brain drain is a problem in any conflict. And the targeting of intellectuals is a problem in many conflicts. And while we haven't seen the kind of targeting that's happened in Iraq, that happened in Iraq, it, it's not impossible that it could happen. Um, so I think it's a very real problem, although it's not directly related to our work. Um, in terms of our study, it's part of a larger multi-country study. So this summer, we'll go to southeastern Turkey, um, northern Iraq. Armenia and hopefully back to Jordan to do a fuller assessment. And then there will be a larger study that will be released at the Clinton Global Initiative for donor consumption. Um, because there are organizations that are very interested in higher education. Certainly UN entities have taken it on as, um, as an important objective. The limitation is 
that, of course, you know, there are competing extremely pressing concerns like medicine, food, and shelter. Um, and these are, these are longer term. I mean, essentially what we're getting at when we talk about something like higher education, which has been discussed as the fourth pillar of humanitarianism, but in, in practical terms is not as compelling as providing food and shelter, and we understand that. However, since this appears not to be as much of an emergency as a protracted crisis with very clear um, end games, if, if action isn't taken, we think that it would be strategic and useful as well as um, the right thing to do to create access to higher education for Syrians within the region because it will allow them to stay close to Syria, which many, many want to do, um, and because it will, with luck, mitigate the language challenges that many Syrian students face because they're educated entirely in Arabic. So for example, in Lebanon, education from primary school is in either, the subjects are taught in French or English, and it is not systematic. It is the principal of each school who decides which subjects are taught in French or English. Of course, so I'm gonna wrap it up. It's a big problem. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. I want to give a chance to uh, I want to respond brief, briefly to Rochelle on the issue of uh, uh, um, uh, non-Western, uh, uh, non I could call them, uh, uh, international NGOs. It's actually something, it's actually an issue which is starting to attract attention. Uh, I just uh, found, but didn't read it yet, a report which was uh, issued a couple of weeks ago by the Conrad Adenauer Foundation on the subject. And UNRWA, uh, in Jordan, no, sorry, in UNHCR in Jordan has commissioned an ongoing study also on the subject. So, you know, it's in the air. Um, it's true that uh, they uh, are off the radar of researchers who are interested in the uh, uh, international uh, humanitarian uh, uh, organization, but not anymore that much. Yeah, but they want, they often want to, uh, to, to remain quite. Uh, 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 you know, under that radar, and they also often do not want to participate in the coordination mechanisms which are set up usually by UNHCR or by, by this coalition of interests. But I think their role is absolutely essential. So, let me just uh, emphasize that uh, the UNHCR is not a point of departure. Yeah, we are used as the point of departure. It's, Palestine refugees trapped in Yarmouk, but you know the situation in our other four fields of operation is, is pretty desperate. You know, if you're a Palestine refugee living in Gaza, aren't you in, in a trapped enclave? If you're living in a in an isolated area in the West Bank, any different? Um, that with the very marginalized existence of Palestine refugees living in Lebanon. So it's just uh, what I want to use is the, uh, the Yarmouk experience, dramatic, extreme, but it's also a symbol of the very tentative existence of Palestine refugees across the region. Uh, no, I was just going to pull together a couple of comments. Um, in the last panel, I think somebody asked, uh, this gentleman asked whether the countries are reaching a breaking point in terms of their capacity uh, to absorb refugees. I don't know that in terms of being able to provide services, uh, uh, like that they're reaching that breaking point, but I think the the region itself is not that big, and the parts of the region that are actually kind of in active conflict are very uh, uh, closely related, and you can only displace people so many times within like a four or five country radius uh, before you actually have to start addressing the root causes of these these conflicts. Uh, so some of what we're talking about here is the ability of NGOs to operate to alleviate suffering, uh, but to actually roll any any of this back, uh, we need to start focusing on political solutions. I know that sounds very trite, but it's uh, I, I think that it's, it's a point that needs to be emphasized, and quite frankly, that I would like to see NGOs uh, more actively uh, promulgate that point of view, that you know, we're doing what we're doing right now because that is solving the immediate problem, but 
this long-term problem needs uh, uh, more attention from state actors.